Welcome to another episode of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. We're going to dive into the Ethereum naming service and how we can use it with our Ethereum Web3 DAP auction example that we've been taking a look at. So the slides in this video are available in our Creative Commons license. So let's talk about the Ethereum naming service. Um, you know, you can design the best smart contract in the world, but if you don't provide a good interface for the users to access that smart contract, then they're not going to use it. So on the traditional internet, we've got the domain name system or DNS, which allows us to use human readable names in the web browser while resolving those names to IP addresses or other types of identifiers behind the scenes. On the Ethereum blockchain, the Ether Ethereum naming system or ENS solves the same problem in a decentralized manner. So for example, the uh, Ethereum foundation donation address is a hash, you know, a hexadecimal hash, zero FX, F FB 691, et cetera, which is, you know, but and it's in a wallet that supports ENS. Uh, but it's, uh, we need something simpler than that. And so instead of using that hash address, we can use ethereum.eth. You know, for ENS, that makes it simple and readable. Uh, but ENS is more than a smart contract. It's a, a decentralized application itself offering this decentralized naming service. Uh, and ENS is supported by a number of other decentralized apps for registration, management, auctions of registered names and so on. So ENS is a good demonstration of how dApps can work together. It's a dApp built to serve other dApps supported by an ecosystem of dApps embedded in other dApps. So we're gonna talk about how ENS works. We'll talk about how you can set up your own name, link it to a wallet or Ethereum address, how you can embed ENS in another dApp and how you can use ENS to name your dApp resources to make them easier to use. So we'll start off with by diving into the history of Ethereum naming services. So name current registration was one of the very first non-currency applications of blockchains with uh, pioneered by Namecoin. Um, the Ethereum white paper, um, original white paper had a a uh, two-line version of a name coin type registration system as one of its example applications. Early releases of Go Ethereum and the C++ Ethereum client had built-in name registration contracts and many proposals and ERCs for name services were made. But it's only when um, the uh, ENS specification started out that this project really got serious. ENS was launched uh, in 2017. ENS is um, specified mainly in three Ethereum improvement proposals. EIP-137, which specifies the basic functions of ENS. Uh, ENS, once, I'm sorry, EIP-162, which describes the auction system for the .eth root and EIP-181, which specifies a reverse resolution of addresses. ENS follows a basic sandwich design philosophy. There's a very simple layer on the bottom, uh, followed by layers of more complex but replaceable code with a very simple top layer that keeps all the funds in separate accounts. And we're gonna dive into these layers in a little more detail. So let's talk about the bottom layer uh, with name owners and resolvers. So the ENS operates on nodes instead of human readable names. A human readable name is converted to a node using the name hash algorithm. The base layer of ENS is a simple contract, less than 50 lines of code, uh, defined by ERC-137 that allows only nodes owners to set information about their names and to create subnodes, which is the ENS equivalent of the domain name system uh, subdomains. The only functions of the base layer are those that enable a node owner to set information about their own node, uh, information like the resolver, the time to live, transferring the owner, and so on, as well as to be able to create owners of new subnodes. The name hash algorithm 
is a recursive algorithm that can convert any name into a hash that identifies the name. Recursive, you know, means that we solve this problem by solving a subproblem that is a smaller problem of the same type, and then use the solution to the subproblem to solve the original problem. You can think of this as kind of like a divide and conquer, where we reduce it uh, to a much smaller problem, and then we start solving the problems all the way back up to the bigger problem. Name hash recursively hashes components of the name, producing a unique fixed length string or node for any valid input domain. For example, the name hash node of subdomain example.eth is going to be using, a, again, we're going to use the Keswick um, algorithm, which is kind of similar to SHA-3, but not exactly SHA-3. Uh, we'll use Keswick of example.eth uh, and Keswick of the subdomain. The subproblem we must solve is to compute the node of, for example.eth which again you know, would be a hash of .eth and a hash of example. So basically we start off with subdomain .example.eth. We're gonna recursively drop it down so that we're basically gonna hash each of those individual components separately. So we're hashing subdomain example and eth separately and then combining them. Um, and so to begin, the first actual hashing computation we do is the one for eth, which is Keswick of the root node plus Keswick of the eth. The root node is what we call the base case of a recursion, and we can't define it recursively or the algorithm will never end. And so the root node is just zero. So putting this all together then, our hash is gonna be, and we've got this little formula here. Of, you know, Keswick and of Keswick of Keswick and then the, of the zero plus the Keswick of the ETH plus uh, the Keswick of the example and the Keswick of the subdomain. Uh, here's another example I'm showing on the slide, a slightly different example, not using uh, Keswick uh, and not using the Ethereum ETH, but we're just showing here uh, using SHA-3 and we're sh doing SHA-3 of mastering Ethereum. And so again, what we're doing here is we're showing you, you know, recursively, we're doing a SHA-3 of the zero plus the SHA-3 of the ETH. The, and then we are taking a SHA-3 of those together and then we're adding it to a SHA-3 of mastering Ethereum. So basically it's a sim very similar process. Slightly different algorithm, in this case we're using SHA-3, which is slightly different than Kessick, but very similar. Now, subdomains can themselves have subdomains. There could be a sub subdomain example ETH after subdomain example ETH, then a sub sub subdomain and so on. To avoid uh, extensive recomputation, since name hash depends only on the name itself, the node for a given name can be pre-computed and inserted into a contract, removing the need for uh, performing uh, immediate lookup of ENS records, regardless of the number of components in the wrong name. You can use, um, you now names can consist of a series of dot separated labels. Uh, we've shown you a couple examples, but although upper and lower case letters allowed, all labels should follow a normalization process that will case fold the labels for hashing them. So names with different case by identical spelling should end up with the same name hash. So it should be case insensitive. You can use labels and domains of any length. But uh, we recommend the following rules we list here. Labels should be no more than 64 characters. A complete ENS name should be no more than 255 characters. And labels shouldn't start or end with hyphens or digits. Let's talk a little about root node ownership. One of the results of this hierarchical system is that it relies on the owners of the root node who are able to create top level domains or TLDs. While the eventual goal is to adopt a decentralized decision making process for new TLDs, uh, the root node is controlled by uh, a multi sig held by people in different countries. As a result, a majority of at least uh, of the key holders is required to affect any change. Currently, the purpose and goal of these key holders is to work in consensus with the community 
to migrate and update the temporary ownership of the East TLD to a more permanent contract, allow adding new TLDs when they're neat when the community thinks they're needed, migrate the ownership of the root multi-sig to a more decentralized contract uh, when that system is agreed upon and implemented, and serve as a last resort way to deal with any bugs and vulnerabilities in the top level registries. So let's talk about resolvers. The basic Ethereum naming system contract can't add metadata names. That's the job of resolver contracts. These resolver contracts are user-created contracts that can answer questions about the name, such as which swarm address is associated with a decentralized app, what address receives payments to the app in Ether or tokens, or what the hash of the app is to verify its integrity. In the middle layer, we've got the Ethereum nodes. At you know, um, you know, um, your first top-level domain that was created was .eth, but there was uh, there's work on enabling additional uh, domains to be available. Um, the ETH domains were distributed by an auction system. Um, so names are distributed via a type of auction that's referred to as a Vicray auction. In a traditional Vicray auction, uh, every bidder submits a sealed bid and all of them are revealed simultaneously, at which point the highest bidder wins the auction, but only has to pay the second highest bid. Therefore, bidders are incentivized not to bid less than the true value of the name to them, since bidding their true value increases the chance they will win, but does not affect the price they will eventually pay. On a blockchain, some changes are necessary if you want to implement an auction like this. To ensure bidders don't submit bids they have no intention of paying, the bidder needs to lock up a value equal to or higher than their bid beforehand to guarantee the bid is valid. Because you can't hide secrets on a blockchain, bidders must execute at least two transactions to commit reveal process in order to hide the original value and name they bid on. So let me talk about that commit reveal process for a second. Basically in this sort of approach, what you're doing is based off of uh, zero knowledge proofs. Uh, the basic idea is you wanna prove you know the secret without revealing the secret until later. Uh, what, what's referred to as commit reveal process. So for example, let's suppose I wanna bid 100 on uh, winning uh, the auction. But, uh, and I'm gonna submit it as a transaction on the blockchain, but I don't want anyone to know I bid 100 on it. So what I do is I take a hash of my, my bid, my number 100, and now that I've got this hash value, you know, this hash value is a hexadecimal value. It doesn't look like the number 100. Um, I submit that hash value up on the blockchain. Then later on, uh, and so everyone in round one, everyone will submit uh, what's referred to in the commit round. Everyone will submit their hashed version of their bid. Then in the commit round, I submit um, the actual bid. I'm sorry, in the reveal round, the second round, I commit. I submit the actual bid, and then everyone submits their actual bid. And at that point, it doesn't matter if someone sees your transaction, because the commit round has already been included in a block previously, and you can't go back and change it. And so, whatever I submit now, when you hash it, has to produce the original commit value. And assuming that it does, then you then your bid is accepted as valid. If you try and change your bid now after you see what the, that I bid 100, uh, it won't match what you submitted in the commit round. And so your reveal round will be considered invalid. So that's how the commit reveal process works. So since you can't reveal all bids simultaneously in a decentralized system, bidders have to obviously submit their own bid themselves as a subsequent uh, transaction. And so if for whatever reason you get really busy and you don't participate in the second round, then obviously you don't win. Uh, now, just a little comment that, uh, you know, it is possible that uh, one could potentially uh, submit multiple bids in this scenario. 
um, and then attempt to, uh, you know, to game the system. And there's a variety of different ways of dealing with it uh, if they attempt that process. So let's talk about a four-step auction process here. Step one, start the auction. Uh, this is required to broadcast the intent to register a name. This creates all the auction deadlines. The names are hashed so that only those who have the name in their dictionary will know which auction was opened. This allows some privacy, which is useful if you're creating a new project and don't want to share details about it. You can open multiple dummy auctions at the same time. So if someone's following you, they can't simply bid on all the auctions you open. Step two, make a sealed bid. Uh, you must do this before the bidding deadline by tying a given amount of ETH to the hash of a secret message containing, among other things, the hash of the name, the actual amount of the bid, and you probably want to put a salt in there as well. You can lock up more ether than you're actually bidding in order to mask your true valuation. Step three, reveal the bid. During the reveal period, you must make a transaction that reveals the bid, which will then calculate the highest bid and the second highest bid and send ether back to the unsuccessful bid bidders. Every time a bid is revealed, the current winner, winner will be recalculated. And the last one to be set before the revealing deadline expires becomes the overall winner. And then we've got a cleanup phase. If you're the winner, you can finalize the auction or to get back the difference between your bid and the second highest bid. If you forgot to reveal, you can make a late reveal and recover some uh, part of your bid. So let's talk about the top layer uh, or the NFT portion here. So the top layer uh, are dealing with deeds. Uh, the top layer of uh, Ethereum naming system is yet another uh, contract with a simple purpose to hold the funds. When you win a name, the funds are not actually sent anywhere, but are just locked up for the period you want to hold the name, at least a year. This works like a guaranteed buyback. The owner does not want the name anymore. They can sell it back to the system and recover their ether. So the cost of holding the name is the opportunity cost of doing something with a return greater than zero. Of course, having a single contract holding millions of dollars in Ether has proven to be very risky. So instead, uh, the Ethereum naming system creates a deed contract, an NFT, for each new name. The deed contract is pretty simple, about 50 lines of code, and only allows the funds to be transferred back to a single account, the owner of the deed, and to be called by a single entity, the register contract. This approach drastically reduces the attack surface where bugs can put the funds at risk. So let's uh, take a look at the timeline for registering a name. So registering a name in the Ethereum naming system is a four-step process, as we saw in the Vic Ray auction slide. First, we place a bid for any available name. Then we reveal our bid after 48 hours to secure the name. The Ethereum naming system timeline for registration is shown on this diagram. Um, so let's start off the process by registering our first name. Uh, you know, we could use one of several available user-friendly interfaces to search for available names, place a bid on a name, reveal the bid, and secure the name. Uh, there are a number of web-based interfaces. The ENS allow us to interact with our ENS uh, decentralized app. Uh, so here, for example, if we look at our timeline, we've got day zero where our auction starts. Uh, the auction begins when the name is available and the auction is opened by someone. And the auction can be open uh, without having to place a bid. Then the domain is available for bidding during the 72 hour bid period. On day three, the bid period is over and now the reveal period starts. Um, and at this point, there's no new bids accepted. And instead, the, the bidders have to reveal their bids. And if they don't reveal it in this two day period, they lose 99.5% of their ether. So at the end of the 48 hour period, the bidder who placed the highest bid wins and pays an amount equal to the second highest bid to become the name owner. The winning bidder has to finalize the auction to become the name owner. Um, and they can finalize the auction anytime after the auction ends. Um, and then the name owner can set up a name resolver anytime after finalizing the auction. So, the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that the name you want is available. So let's suppose, for example, you wanted to search for um, the name Ethereum book in Ethereum name system service. Um, and you do a search. 
here and it'll tell you whether or not it's actually available. And in this case, it's available. And you could use your metal mass wall to start an auction to see if you can get that name uh, in a few days. This is a little bit different from traditional domain name system where, you know, if you go to a website that sells DNS names, you basically will get um, a website telling you how much money they want for it. Uh, and depending on the name and how many other users are using something like that, the, the prices can vary dramatically. So. So let's suppose we want to continue on. We want to start an auction for this Ethereum book name. Uh, we'll put in our basic bid amount, our, our first bid here, uh, 0 0.01. Uh, we can uh, post the amount we actually want to put down to sort of mask what uh, the amount we're actually bidding is. In this case, we just put the same down. And you want to use a secret to be able to claim uh, your bid later. And in this case, we just picked these three words as our secret, reduce blood annual. So. Now to actually uh, start our auction, here we've got a little screenshot of what we just did. Uh, this will show us our account we're putting in that shows you your reveal date your auction date uh, and so on and are you sure you want to do it um and then we can go ahead and start uh and once we in this particular case we're actually using the ethereum metamask wallet to do this and so we can see our wallet has popped up a little thing saying hey i'm using uh, MetaMask to make this ENS registered transaction. Um, and it's telling me how much gas we're going to have to pay and what the current gas price is and what our maximum transaction fee is likely to be. And then we go ahead and press submit or we can decline it. Um, and of course, uh, if all goes well after submitting that transaction, you're going to want to return in a couple days during the reveal phase and go ahead and reveal that your, your bid that you made. So the next step is to, once we've registered our ENS name, we need to manage it. And we can use uh, Ethereum Naming System Manager to do that, or ENS Manager. So enter the name of the ENS you want to manage. In this case, it would be Ethereum Book ETH. Um, and you can create subdomains. You can set a resolver contract. You can connect names to appropriate resources, such as swarm addresses for, DAP, for your DAP front ends. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a subdomain for our auction DAP. Uh, we'll just name it auction. So the fully qualified name is going to be auction.etheriumbook.eth. And so you can see here, we've got our ENS manager. We've got our resolver details, the name, the owner, the owner and the resolver are hashes. And then we can list you know, our updates and so on. So once we've created the subdomain, we can then enter auction Ethereum book ETH in a search box and manage it just as we manage the domain, the higher level domain. So in ENS, resolving a name is a two-step process. The ENS registry is called uh, with the name to resolve after hashing it. If the record exists, the registry returns the address of its resolver. Then in step two, the resolver is called using the method appropriate to the resource being requested. And then the resolver returns the desired result. This two-step process has several benefits. Separating the functionality of resolvers from the naming system gives us more flexibility. The owners and names can use custom resolvers to resolve any type of resource extending the functionality of Ethereum naming system. For example, if in the future you wanted to link a geolocation re resource like longitude and latitude to an ENS name, you can create a new resolver that answers geolocation queries. You know, whatever type of applications you need in the future, you can build with custom resolvers. Uh, there are default public resolvers that can resolve a variety of different resources, like addresses for wallets and smart contracts, uh, content resolving, uh, like swarm hashes for dApps, smart contract source code, and so on. 
So since we want to link our auction DAP to a swarm hash, we can use the public resolver, which supports content resolution, shown in this little diagram here. Uh, we don't need to code or deploy a custom resolver in this case. We can just specify, hey, this is what we want to use. We want to use a content resolver that's by default. Um, now let's say we want to uh, resolve a name to a, a swarm hash. Once the resolver for auction the Ethereum book ETH is set to be the public resolver, we can set it to return the swarm hash as the content you receive when someone tries to resolve auction.etherianbook.eth. So after we set that up, after waiting a short time for our transaction to be confirmed, we should be able to resolve the name correctly. Uh, before setting a name, our auction DAP can be found on the swarm gateway by its hash. Um, after we set it, we now can uh, use swarm.gateway.net and just specify auction Ethereum book ETH. Um, and so that's a lot easier than having to use a hexadecimal hash to reference um, a particular auction DAP. And so that's really the benefit of this Ethereum naming system is not to have to use hashes in our URLs because obviously a hash in a URL means one small typo anywhere in there and you're not going to recover your resource. Um, so over the past uh, several uh, lectures, we gradually took a look at a uh, decentralized application. We started with some smart contracts to run an auction for ERC 721 deeds. Uh, those contracts were designed to not have any governing or privileged accounts, so that their operation was uh, decentralized to the maximum extent possible. We then added a front end implemented in JavaScript that offered a convenient and user friendly interface to our DAP. The auction DAP uses a decentralized storage system Swarm to store application resources such as images. Uh, IPFS would also be a good alternative to Swarm. The DAP also uses a decentralized communications protocol Whisper to offer an encrypted chat room for each auction without central servers. We then uploaded the entire front end to Swarm um, so that our DAP doesn't rely on any front web servers to serve the files. Finally, we allocate a name for a DAP using ENS, connecting it to the Swarm hash to the front end so that the users can access it with a simple and easy to remember human readable name. And with each of these steps, we increase the decentralization of our application on this continuum between a centralized app and a decentralized app. The final result is a decentralized app that has no central point of authority, no central point of failure, and expresses the Web3 vision. So here's a look at our auction DAP architecture. We've got the user who's interacting through a DAP browser, and you can see behind that DAP browser, you've got the Ethereum blockchain, you've got Swarm with the content, auction images, HTML, content style sheets, a JavaScript front end. We got Whisper for our messaging for auction chat rooms. We got the Ethereum naming service to allow us to access this DAP browser on auction, Ethereum book ETH. And then the Ethereum blockchain itself is supporting these two smart contracts, the auction repository contract and the deed repository contract. So in summary, Decentralized applications are the culmination of the Ethereum vision as expressed by the founders of the Ethereum platform in their earliest designs. While a lot of applications call themselves dApps today, most uh, applications that are leveraging Web3 technologies are not fully decentralized. However, it is possible to construct applications that are more decentralized than other applications. Over time, as the technology matures, more and more applications can be decentralized further, resulting in more resilience, more censorship resistance, and a freer internet. And we took a look in this example uh, at several different ways in which we can bring decentralization in. Uh, using smart contracts, using IPFS and Swarm, using peer-to-peer -peer messaging, the Ethereum naming service, and so on. But tune in next time when we're going to dive into the Ethereum virtual machine in greater detail.